Hello, welcome to The Secret Mind. My name's Jules. Poem day. We're going to do some more poems. I've had some feedback on the poems uh, that I should give less commentary and more poems. So, let's see if that happens. Uh, we're doing, we're trying to find fun poems. Now, I'm working through this book, you'll remember, which is the funny Henry Normal collected poems. Um, I'm going to zip through another ten. Not going to do them all. Then I've got two other things to show you. Then we're out of here. Um, we're looking for good poems that are worth repeating, uh, or ones that are good messages, or ones that will uh, find a theme that will be of interest in writing your own, maybe. Um, so we're up to page thirty-four of this book. It's a poem called Cueva de la Manos. I don't know what it means. Um, it was, uh, sometimes it's just the theme in a poem, and the theme is often in the final phrase. And the final the final sentence of this poem, I'm not going to do the whole thing, even though it's not long. I'll just do the final bit. Whether we call it art or human nature, on every continent something survives, vulnerable as dust. Over 2,000 generations call, each with a simple statement as urgent as blood through veins. I am here, I am here, I am here. So... I think the poem is just based around that final line, just uh, saying, see me, notice me, uh, see me, not the terrible words that your teacher or your boss would say, uh, your teacher would write at the bottom of your homework, see me, and it would just strike terror, or your boss at work would say, could I have a word, please, oh, please do it now, don't make, don't let's wait till three o'clock in the afternoon, I'll die of suspense. So, uh, and if you're in those positions, please don't say those words to people, bosses and teachers, ever. Can I have a word, please? Just like a word. So, see me. Yeah. So, I am here. So, uh, which of course, now what's happening in society, of course, is uh, we've got a popular meme, is it? Of being seen. So, I was recently in a class where I had to turn to the person to my left, something that is always going to strike utter terror into your gentle soul, uh, and say, I see you. Yeah. Yes, I occasionally find myself in rooms like that. You know who you are, group leaders. This is an abuse of power. Now, the next poem is called Abiogenesis to Revelations. Didn't know the, world, the word abiogenesis, so I've had to look it up. Um, abiogenesis, in biology, is the idea... Uh, it is the origin of life. In biology, abo abiogenesis, or the origin of life, is the natural process by which life has arisen from non-living matter, such as simple organic compounds. Uh, this is a, uh, a gushing poem. I've got a, I think it's about having a child. Uh, so, um, and it's reasonably personal to him. Uh, last few lines I'm told there are no numbers or names in nature existence is dependent, independent of the mind love and beauty just icons on a computer screen I'm overawed by every single atom moments like this I could believe in God moments like this I could kiss him it's sort of a, that's the end of it, it's a gushing sort of affair didn't connect with me uh, this is a bit more fun the joy of frogs um, it's a bit more accessible if you're going to draw specifics in poems, the whole point is to draw them out a little into generalisations that we can all connect with, I think, not just doing a very selfish diary report on your own life. Um, so you, you maybe don't have to complete that journey of generalisation, but you've got to start us on the bottom rung of the ladder and help us get there. Um, otherwise, you're making us work a bit too hard. Um, this is a bit more fun, though. Um, I'm not sure if it's got any rhyme in it. There may be some of those funny poem lines where they're trickily hidden inside. Let's find out by reading it out loud. It's okay. I'll take this one. The Joy of Frogs by Henry Normal. Frogs need kisses like anyone else. Not all of them want to become handsome princes. Some prefer a more pond-based lifestyle. What if you turn into a handsome prince and the princess really prefers frogs? What if you're not that handsome a prince? Maybe you're more handsome a frog. Let's face it, chances are, if you can get, get kissed regularly by a princess and remain a frog, 
you've got it made. If she gives you tongues, then go for it. So that is quite a nice uh, idea of mismatched couples, perhaps. Uh, there was somebody I was watching a documentary on, Rod Hill, Rod Hull, the um, puppet master of Emu, very, very popular um, puppet and uh, uh, double act, if you like, and TV star. And he was um, very prolific with the ladies, even through his marriages, Rod Hull. And uh, he was seen by a reputable director who appeared on this uh, documentary, uh, which is on YouTube. And um, they called these people who wanted to um, get off with the not that pretty Rod Hull and all these glorious uh, girls, uh, which he referred to rather ungenerously as star fuckers. Um, so... Frogs and Princes. Henry Normal says it in one way. This director says it in another. Next poem is called Beauty and the Insect Heart. Um, this was another one. There was no real relief from the melancholy. It's very personal. I think it will be rewarding, rewarding to reread. Um, and he talks about him built in himself building a cathedral of words and I think it was a poem about him driving home maybe after a gig of reading his poems um, but it's harder work and I'm not going to do it here but I think there's something out there but it didn't quite um, didn't quite make me want to read it out in this one I'm trying to keep it a little bit just a little bit lighter even though a lot of these things are melancholy but it was a good poem the next one is a bit quicker. If you should ever climb a tree. So this is quite a nice one. We'll zip through this. It's only about 15 lines. I'm not sure how much weight my head can support, but I enjoy the familiarity, the casual lack of boundaries. Without a word, we get a sense of someone. If you should ever climb a tree, I will be your low hanging branch. I want that to be unquestioned. If my neck snaps, it was meant to be. It is the most important thing to know. In the absence of sufficient language, I'd rather seek out trees to remind you. So, to me, I think that's about a choice of metaphor. metaphor. Um, choosing, he's telling us he's choosing trees to describe how he feels. Um, and just it's just a promise of support to somebody, I think. And... Uh, uh, putting your hand up to be a support. If you should ever climb a tree, I'll be your low-hanging branch. Uh, if my neck snaps, it was meant to be. You take your chances in life. Simple message, but well set. First four lines, I didn't really connect with. Um, probably you don't need them. Could just start with, without a word, we, we get a sense of someone. If you should ever climb a tree, I'll be your low-hanging branch. I think that's as good. Yeah, we'll get rid of those. Am I allowed to edit somebody else's poems and say cross out lines? Very, it seems very rude. Uh, the next one is called Uncomfortably Positive. Uh, this is another one about uh, Henry's autistic son. Um, uh, so I think I'll read it out because um, it's got a couple of points towards the end. This might not seem that different a picture to you, but this is the look of a mother to her autistic child taking his first photo. The look of a mother anticipating success. The coal face of optimism. The body language of hope. If I was susceptible to joy, this could easily affect me. Unlike my wife, I have Im immunity to all forms of jubilation. I err towards caution, bordering scepticism on matters of good fortune or progress. This condition we embrace, I've learnt, is, non, is not linear, not predictable like neurotypical behaviour. Five minutes after you leave us, you will turn to one another and say, well, we, we can see where that comes from. So, yeah, I'm not sure. What is that about? The child is taking his first photo. First, when I read it, I thought, I thought he was taking the photo, but it might be having his photo taken. 
in English, those those two opposites use the same words. Um, so I'm not sure. Um, and then they say, this condition we embrace is not linear, not predictable, like neurotypical behaviour. Oh, yeah, so he means not predictable, like neurotypical behaviour. He means unpredictable, like neurotypical behaviour is unpredictable. Or does he? Does he mean the opposite? Is it predictable or not predictable? Is neurotypical behaviour? Surely it's unpredictable, not predictable. Well, I think you should have clarified that, Henry. Uh, it finishes on a slight gag, um, which is a nice reference of the cliché. Um, so there's two things that are misunderst misunderstandable. So needs a bit of work. It's not finished, in my view. <laughs> Sorry. Um, this one is also called She is Looking at the Camera. So maybe these were written at the same time or something. Um, not going to read the whole thing out. It's uh, a little bit wordy. Final verse, though. It's easy to look into the camera. It's what's expected. Isn't the unexpected more interesting, though? Somehow more beautiful, more human. A quiet blow for the world of other. That's nice. Now, this next one is also a, a slightly, well, it's the subject of loneliness. But it's I've got a very nice structure to it. Uh, and it's called The Questions They Don't Ask on the Census. And it's quite accessible. It's, it's um, well, this is it. Hands up anyone who is lonely or has ever felt loneliness. Anyone who has hidden themselves away on New Year's Eve rather than face that hiatus of emptiness in public. Anyone who has dressed up on a Saturday night and forced themselves out into the Malay only to return home, not having not spoken to a single soul. Anyone who has searched faces on the pavement for a fragment of recognition. Anyone who has stood at the edge of a window in hope. Anyone who has touched a photo in remembrance. Anyone who has put a pillow behind them in the dark against the cold. Anyone who finds a mirror the hardest place to look or lowers their eyes when they meet someone. Anyone who wakes without knowing what for. Anyone afraid of being found wanting. That's a nice little essay on loneliness. Why it's a poem? I've got no idea. It doesn't rhyme, but it's neat. But to me, I don't understand why that's a poem, except that it's short. Should tenderness become plague? This short one, this four lines, maybe only 15 words or something. Here we go. Should tenderness become plague? Let's start that again. Should tenderness become plague? Glory in its infection. Carry its contagion and pray the germ is hereditary. Okay. Uh, the next one is called Staring Directly at the Eclipse. Did I enjoy this when I read it? Um... I think it's just generally about all of life. Anyway, it's the final one we're doing of Henry's. So here we go. Your feet on my lap as we settle for the night. A shoreline to ourselves, sunlight on water. Nature catching the eye unexpected. Fresh air intoxicating. Getting lost in art or endeavour. Music that carries and caresses. Food presented as a gift. Being surprised by genius or kindness. Your face flush and immediate. A friendly soul at my window. Hope in all forms, however tiny. The comforting mundanity of doing nothing much. The absence of pain and fear, however fleeting. A familiar arm around my shoulder. The satisfaction of something done well. Loyalty and honour embraced. Minor revelations of perception. The defiance within spirit against overwhelming odds, valour and grace in the face of the inevitable. To spite death and make victory, make his victory hollow. Yeah, nice. That's called staring directly at the eclipse. 
it feels like a poem, even without without the rhyme. Little couplets of uh, poetic observations. Um, hmm. They feel a bit random, maybe. I don't think I'm not sure the flow through the poem quite quite does it, but uh, you do your own version and send it to me, and I'll read it out on the podcast. Uh, I mean, why not? Now that is that. We've done ten poems. Well done. You made it through to the end. Um, nice, but not ones I'm going to carry with me through my life. I've got two other things for you. Um, some while back, thinking about this, I ordered another book of poems that seemed to be, have five stars on Amazon, totally randomly. And I thought, this is bound to have brilliant stuff in it. Look at all these fabulous reviews. It's called This, Trappings, by a fellow called Richard Howard, who's an American, very, very, very swatty guy. Um, and uh, I dipped into it because I'm trying to find stuff. Um, and it's awful. I mean, it must be brilliant, but to me it's just true. Let's pick a random number. Next two numbers I see are n- nine and two. Uh, it's only got 80 pages, so let's page, pick page 29. I can guarantee you whatever I read out of here will be dreadful. 20, 29. Uh, started a chapter, 17th of March, 1977. Why it has a date in the middle of it, I don't know. To the di- It's called Family Values 4. To the Director, Administrative, Officers, Executives and Trustees of the Astor, now Public Library of New York City. Dear Sirs, I address you in confidence. Although the League by which I am empowered, I hold the mission as a sacred trust to preserve, defend and deed to pursue national honour as authorised me should our petition be disallowed. It goes on like that for 80 pages. It is beyond awful. I was going to not trouble you with this um, because somebody's obviously laboured over the, how brilliant it is. This guy's won all sorts of awards. I think he may have passed on within the last year or two in his 90s. I mean, well done him. Uh, and then I noticed one thing. For all the w- ways that he must have poured over his words and and they must connect with somebody. Um, there's a bunch of errors in the book. And they print the errata out at the beginning of the book. Yeah, it's a, it's a little insert that's been glued into the book. The page is smaller than the other page. It's been glued in after the public pu- publisher has produced this in 1999. And I noticed in reading it, uh, A, they... Each of them made me laugh about how each of these mistakes could slip through this this work that the entire reason for being is to use words to their supposedly greatest advantage. And these <laughs> nine, nine lines of errors have crept in. And then if you read it out, something really amazing happens. It becomes a poem. And to my argument, it becomes the only poem in the book. It's got truth. It's got contradiction, paradox. Each mistake is funny. Just imagining the processes of what what has gone on into that, what has gone into that mistake being made by whatever copywriter or print setter has done it. Uh, so I'm going to read it out to you, and I think I might be able to uh, put it up for you. I get my tech right. Let's bear with me. And I'm going to put it on a screen. I'm going to read it out to you. Um, This is there, I think. Here we go. So, errata, page three, last line. Pretension should read pretension. Page 34, line two. Belma should read Belma. Page 41, line 25. O coward heart. Would be to challenge this, should read, O coward heart, would be to challenge this. Page 42, line 5, Tradutore, should read, Tradutore. Page 44, line 18, Dispatches, should read, Dispatches. Page 53, line 5, Enemy, should read, Enemy. 
Page 69, line 15, no should be capitalised. Page 79, line 12, Cretaceous should read Cretaceous. Now that is funny. I don't care what anybody thinks. It's going to the charity shop because the rest of the book is dreadful, but the mistakes are hilarious and the only, only poem in the book, in my view. So, that's that. Now, <laughs> um, before I finish, I did order something else by a funny fellow. I did a uh, Roger McGough poem the other day. So I ordered this. Now, I'm a bit fearful that it might turn out to be a kid's book. Um, but... Um, so I'm just going to do the first two poems because they uh, are written to the writer of the poem and the reader of the poem, and those are the titles. Uh, the trouble with both Henry's that normal poems and Roger McGough's poems is they're best read by them. They've got both got brilliant voices for doing it, but I'm afraid today you've got me. This is called The Writer of This Poem by Roger McGough. The writer of this poem is taller than a tree. As keen as the north wind, as handsome as can be. As bold as a boxing glove, as sharp as a nib. As strong as scaffolding, as tricky as a fib. As smooth as an ice cream, as quick as a lick. As clean as a chemist shop, as clever as a tick. The writer of this poem never ceases to amaze. He's one in a million billion, or so the poem says. Just, just very nice and gentle and accessible. The reader of this poem, this is his next poem. The reader of this poem. The reader of this poem is as cracked as a cup, as daft as treacle toffee, as mucky as a pup, as troublesome as bubblegum, as brash as a brush, as bouncy as a double tum, as quiet as a shush, as sneaky as a witch's spell, as tappy toe as jazz, as empty as a wishing well, as echoey as 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 bossy as a whistle, as prickly as a pear. Of boots made out of thistles and elephant hair. As vain as trainers, as boring as a drawer. As smelly as a drain is outside the kitchen door. As hungry as a wave that feeds upon the coast. As gaping as the grave, as gotcha, as a ghost. As fruitless as a cake of soap. As creeping up as smoke. The reader of this, of this poem, I hope, knows how to take a joke. So... There we are. That's a bit of fun. Do more of those. Try and find some for you. For now, goodbye. See you tomorrow.